You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your host, Thomas Ahrens. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle, located in Winchester, Virginia. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will. Good morning, everybody. Welcome back to Fishing the DMV. I'm your host, Thomas Ahrens. And today we have a really special guest. This guy, uh, he tamed the Rappahannock with the Northern Virginia Kayak Association. Dude, congratulations on your win. That's really awesome. It was a great time. Uh, I didn't think it was going to come so soon. Uh, I, it feels like I've been chasing an NVKBA trophy for a long time, but in the grand scheme of things, it's really probably the opposite. But uh, it was a great day. I had a lot of fun. I mean, I mean, before any I have any tournament winner on, I really like to get the backdrop of the story going into this. Um, I mean, first off, how many years have you been fishing NVKBA and kayak tournaments in general? Kayak tournaments? two years uh i've really only been fishing for three uh i messed around as a kid with some stuff a little bit you know just like bobber and worm stuff but nothing that would carry over into what i'm doing now (laughs) but uh it all started with uh some girl wanted me to take her on a date she said we should go fishing so i was like oh well i'm i'm a dude i can figure that out i'm sure we'll catch a ton of fish and uh i had my heart set on bass for whatever reason I guess iconic fish. And uh, we went out to a public pond and I looked up a guide on how to throw a Senko and all that. And we, we went out and we tried and tried and tried and we didn't catch fish. And that stung my ego bad. <laughs> <laughs> Anyone who fished a public pond knows, you know, not exactly a premier spot to go bass fishing. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, you can get it done. There's fish to be caught. It's a great way to start, but uh, it can be a grind if it's pressure and, I lived down in Richmond, so there definitely was. Uh, and, I mean, it must have been five or six months where I just watched every YouTube video I could, and I could not make it happen. I hooked a few, lost them. And I just couldn't figure it out. And then one day, I tied on a chigger craw and just went out to the local pond, and I just flipped it around. And finally, I dropped it next to a log, and the line just shot off. And I did the cool bass hook set. And it was just done from there. I was like, man, this is the greatest thing in the world. And that was before I even had a kayak. Like, I didn't even know what it would turn into. Uh, And then I say 2021, I think the winter of 2021 going into 2022, I'd saved up. And I'd been watching all these kayak fishing videos, you know, the Minor Boys, Christine Fisher, whoever, Greg Blanchard, all those guys. And, uh... I was like, I want to try this. This looks cool, especially the tournament stuff. Because I'd already started co-anglering for just like a regional Bassmaster Club in Richmond. And, you know, like, you know, like eight, ten boats, nothing crazy. But I had won as co-angler in September and then October at the Pamunkey and Bugs Island. So I already knew wow. that. Wow, 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 wow. And at the Pamunkey, uh, I was fishing with Ryan Boggs. He's a local guy. I don't, he hadn't fished in a while, but we just went around with a whopper plopper and a Senko and just pounding them classic bass fishing. And I was like, man, this is so much fun, but I can't afford a boat. So that's when the seed kind of got planted. It was like, I want to be calling the shots. I want to, because we were running up and down river and all around. And he very much fishes with that uh, Carolina style where you just bounce all over. Running gun. And then the next event, I got put with uh, Farron Painter. He fishes some of the Elite 70 events. Hmm. Very angler. I mean, you want to learn how to wind a spinnerbait or flip a jig fast? That's the guy to learn from. We went to Bugs Island, and we won the same exact way, just flying all over the lake, every dock. We were just pounding them. And so I was like, oh, this is how you win at fishing. So that's what kind of planted my tournament seed was like, I like to go fast. I'm very much a power fisherman. I like to run, run, run. And uh, then I got the kayak that winter, and I immediately just jumped into tournaments. I didn't even know about practicing yet. I I hadn't heard of practicing. You know, I just was like, I'm just going to show up to all these places and bash some bass and catch them like I used to in the boat. But I wasn't calling the shots, so I didn't know how to make calls or how to anything about you know, fishing a tournament well. So I just went out and fished the first season. 
And I mean, you can go back to any of those events last year. I didn't do very well. Uh, but the thing about me is that I just, I fish every moment I can. And when I'm not, I'm watching something on YouTube or listening to a podcast. I like to learn. I like to get better. That's what makes it fun for me. And so that's what kind of got me started was I, I got my Old Town Sports from PDL 120. I went straight out to Lake Anna and I had just a phenomenal day in the kayak. And I was like, okay, I can't afford a boat, but I can do this. And so I just fully committed to that. And now we're here at my first real win is what I'd call it. This is like kind of a bigger field. But yeah. It, the one thing I want to I want to hit on too is when you say about the information thing, it is so interesting that, you know, I'm old enough to know when it was a VHS tape of Al Linder uh, talking about like the Bass Bible. It was, it was the Bassmaster magazine. But now, shit, everything is YouTube and podcasts for me as well. Like, and there's so much information you want at your fingertips. If you want to know the the hottest new technique in Japan, you can turn the captions on to English and you can literally watch it as it's being developed. It's insane how quick we can get information and learn things. And it's crazy because there's some stuff that really hasn't left the boat dock. You know, mm -hmm. there's a lot of stuff where it's like, even just here, it's like I've had to really get to know guys for them to even give it up they do i can go on google and look for it for hours and i'll never find it so there's like this cool balance where it's like you have all this information at your fingertips but some stuff is still stuck in the analog world and to really get the most out of both i think you gotta you gotta know people and you gotta put in the time watching stuff and even then you have to discern the information of what you think is good and bad and I think that's really important. I, I'm glad you hit on that too, where you do still need the connections. I mean, I, I have friends that, that fish the BFLs, the Opens, uh, the, you know, the, the Hobie series, MVKBA, and all of them have that one thing where they're like, I knew a person when I got started that was a, just had so much information, a Charlie Taylor that really helped me get going and really gave me like the inside edge on success. That is, see, it's hard because I want to be like, oh, well, I'm I'm self-taught because, you mm -hmm. know, the way I am. But I I have to credit those regional Bassmaster guys. I mean, we're fishing eight to ten boat tournaments. And that's not big at all, you know. No. But uh, that's what got me started. And that's where I really started to learn, like, okay, this is what you need to expect to win. You need 13 pounds here. Here you might be 20. Good point. If you're starting out, you just think, oh, well, I need to go catch them. Uh, and you know, you catch a hundred inches anywhere and you're probably in a good place, but not everywhere can give up a hundred inches consistent and, uh, planning around what you think you need, especially for me, I'm very big on like counting on patterns. Like, okay, I can count on a bite here for an hour. If I fish this every hour, I'll probably get a bite. And just being able to learn that from other guys has really set me up to, boost through a lot of what I had to have learned because it I mean to hang with some of the guys who've been fishing their whole life especially the guys who've been t doing tournaments since they were like kids yeah uh you got to really put in the work to catch up to those guys you know and I think that's kind of it's all really a race when it comes to tournament fishing how sharp can you be get on tournament day how sharp can you be you know making everything align and then just and then just being out there and just fishing more. I, I mean, usually when you see the guys that win a lot, generally speaking, not not always, you look at how many tournaments they fish that year. It's insane. Um, mm -hmm. It's rarely it's a guy that says like, I only fished two tournaments this year and I won one of them. Like no one has a fifty or a hundred percent win rate. A John Cox is an example, or, or a Keith Poche, really right mm -hmm. now where they're fishing what two or three divisions and they maybe win one or two each year. And it shows you that like, not only do you have to like what you said there, have the knowledge, be on the cutting edge, but then you got to get out there and just, you fish tournaments again and again and again. So you have your chance to, to hit a home run too. And, and that's, that's so freaking important. It's like learning a new technique. It's like, you feel like it's not going to work and then you hook one on it and it's like, Oh, I can catch them on this. Mm -hmm. And, start putting it together but it's like you need that one little spark and that actually goes into this win the, not the weekend before but the weekend before that was the virginia kayak trail on the chickahominy river and i won that event it was only like 15 guys but it kind of got my ball rolling it's like okay i've won a kayak event 
pressure's off now. Now it's like, okay, I know I can make the calls, whatever. Then I go and do an MVKBA event. Next event, I win that one. It's like, okay, now the ball's really rolling. Mm-hmm. It just happened a lot faster than I ever could have expected. And it's, I feel like this year, especially last year, I tried to keep up and fish every event I possibly could. And I was kind of spreading myself too thin too early. It's like now, if I fish every event, it's like, okay, I've got a lot more tenure on me. I've fished in tournaments, made some bad mistakes where it's like, okay, I can learn from that. But it's all really a, a lot of, uh, you got to put yourself in the position. If you're not fishing a lot, it's going to hurt you. I talk to guys and they're like, oh, well, I don't pre-fish for any of these. And it's like, I mean, if you don't have the time, obviously you don't have the time, but it's like you're hurting yourself by not just looking at the body of water, just getting a feel. You know, you don't even have to drop a line. It's like, okay, yeah. I've looked at it at least. I can observe it. That, that's a fun, like, philosophical conversation because I it, it is weird. Like, if I've never been there before, I want to see it. But then it's almost like if it's your home body of water, do you want to see it more or less before 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 yeah. game time? I and mean, let's just take whatever. I mean, what would you consider your home body of water? Definitely Lake Anna. Okay. In the season, yeah. I'm out there all the time. It also just so happens that like the past two years, we've kind of had that as an early season event, NBKBA. This year, I didn't do too good for exactly the reason I think you're talking about. I was way too caught up in, oh, well, I need to do well here. This is my home. I know it well. And I thought I knew it better than I did, <laughs> you know? Mm. I get caught up in all these preconceived notions. It's like, well, this is just like that day. And so this should be happening and blah, blah, blah. And it's like, I felt like if I had just chilled out and been like, well, I'm comfortable here. I should just fish how I like. Probably would have done a lot better, you know? And that's funny because like when they did the first Battle of Five Lakes tournament and I knew I was going to fish Sleeters, I was like, I'm not going to pre-fish. I fished this thing for 10 years and I know if I pre-fish, it's going to give me a way too much stuff in my head. I just want to show up and if the main stuff doesn't work, I'm just going to go fishing because that's what I would do anyway. It, it mm-hmm. is do that. And I think sometimes you get too much experience. It's so hard. And you get the, you get the random crazy people like McCluskey who can win basically every other day on like the res or, you know, Tyler who fishes like, and he's a yeah, uh, high pole guide services. There are some weird standouts that can somehow live on a lake and still fish it every day and still win. But I know personally, I'm not that person. If I spend too much time on a place, I'm not, I'm not, and I guess guys, for people that are listening, I'm not saying practice isn't bad. I'm just saying like, I think there's this neat little, like there's a sweet spot you want to get in where you practice a lot, but you're not so intimate with the place. You try to outthink it. Cause then that's, that's when you get your ass kicked by a guy that comes in from like Canada and he sees it for two days and he wins because he, he's not blinded by data. Yeah, a big thing for me is I like to have my, like when I start fishing a tournament, it's like my brain just goes to like free form thought. It's just running. Mm -hmm. It's just a free stream sentence going. And a lot of times I'll get too lost in that and I got to keep it in check. So a big thing for me is gut instinct. I like to run huge half and make the calls off my gut. It's like, do I make this adjustment? It doesn't feel right right now. So I don't. And a lot of that is just like, if you're just playing like textbook all the time, you're not going to win, I don't think. Because you're going to be too caught up in, well, it's cloudy, so I can't throw this. Oh, mm-hmm. well, it's blah, 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 so I can't throw this. It's like, they're fish. They're weird sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> especially on somewhere like a tidal fishery. It, especially a tidal fishery. It's like, you got to really put in some time before you can even understand like, oh, this is... I can rely on this, on this body of water. Whereas like on a lake, a lot less time you got to put in before you can be like, all right, this is usually a pattern. So for me, especially in this event, it was like, all right, I really need to trust the gut on this one. And that's how it was at the chick too. I have a lot of experience on the chick for me, you know, I, don't, I ain't been fishing that long, but for out of the places I've fished, chick is like an hour from me, 45 minutes ish. So I've put in a lot of time there. So going into the event before this one, I was like, all right, I kind of know what to expect, but I'm just going to go fishing. Uh, and I knew some things about that place where it's like, all right, I know this exists on the chick. Like, at, you know, you talk to local boys about black buzz bait, throw a black buzz bait. You can get caught, you can catch fish all day on a black buzz bait. And it's like, 
there's a certain point where you got to step away from like the normal patterns because you need to be a little different. But the other thing is if you get too far away, then you're doing stupid stuff. So it's a weird game where it's like, well, this is tested and proven, but you still got to be able to break away out of that stuff, you know, to be able to win and be different. Well, let's get into the next chapter of this story. Um, and make sure I'm on the same page. You fished all the NVKBA events this year, correct? Okay. Yeah. So, I'm trying to do that full season. Uh, and I'm hoping to next year, but it just depends on how the way things go. Because for me, I care about fishing in the biggest and best club. I mean, I live in Richmond, and I, right now I really believe NBKBA is the best one in Virginia. And so I make the drive, but it's like it's hard because it's like a lot of these guys, they live on the Potomac or they live on the Shenandoah. So it's like events like the Potomac where it's like, a lot of the spots there, that's a two hour drive for me, mm -hmm. up I five, no less. It's hard to hang with those guys, but I just want to fish against the most and the best people. And I think that club has it. So the first event of the year, your home lake, correct? Yeah. How do you feel going into that event? Oh, man, I felt good. Um, and the spot I have that I fished the year before. That was the probably the best I did last year. I had a small limit and I was just cranking docks and I was wearing them out. Like I was catching, I caught probably 60 or 70 fish, but they're all 11 inches. <laughs> I figure out that pattern to, you know, push the size up, but I was catching fish. So I was like, oh, the big ones are going to come. The big ones are going to come. But I didn't know how to make adjustments yet. So I limited out last year. This year, I'm like, all right, I'm going to go try to do a similar deal. We'll see how the weather is. Um, but I know the creek I want to be in and, uh, last year and this year, uh, me and Greg Oaks, who's leading the angler year race, we were sharing it and, uh, we shared it and I, in the morning, it was awesome. I caught three right off the rip, but what happened to me last year is a bass boat flew by and I know exactly where he went and he caught one fish off this one tree where I know a big one is almost always on. And he flies back out the creek. And I'm like, man, I needed that one. Because I had five. So I was like, oh, if I get a big one, it'll be great. After that, this year, after I was like, man, they're biting. I need to get to the big fish spot fast. And I got all spun out. And someone was already fishing there. And then it screwed me for the rest of the day. And I totally spun out. And I managed to get one more out. But only because some guy at the boat ramp was like, get back out there. You can't come in early. <laughs> and I was like, damn, you're holding me accountable? What? <laughs> Uh, but sure enough he was like he, he was like you need to get back out there and catch a limit and i was like all right and uh i managed to catch one more that was good for aoy points i guess but uh i really wasn't happy with that performance i really wanted to do well in that event um but off to a rough start at lake anna but um, you survived and and, yeah. that, and that's kind of what's important and i'm actually guys like as he's talking i'm just bringing up all the data from all the tournaments now just so we can ha have the point stuff because you're still doing really good point wise mm -hmm. yeah after like, I, he hasn't even added in that event no so he hasn't up a bit you know uh and i'm still in the rookie of the year race because i didn't finish a full season last year but uh he hasn't done the leaderboard whoever does it uh for no. rookie Come on, dude. What are you what are you doing? You gotta like update this board a little bit earlier so we have yeah. it available. Yeah. But you know, the club is so well ran. Every time I nitpick at stuff like that, that it's like, ah, you know. I uh, just like to bust his balls. But I mean, dude, it, and that's what's saying is like interesting here. That's your home lake, and I feel like you were thinking that this was your year one to start the year. Exactly. It, it was like, hey, everything else is an uphill battle, but I have this one. And so when I didn't do as well, that really stung, you know. Uh, and next year, I'm assuming we're going to Lake Anna, but yeah, I'm gonna be, I'm gonna be all jazzed up now because now I'm gonna feel like I have to redeem myself. Well, our water, I guess. Well, then going leaving that event and going into the, into the next stop, you know, on on the Potomac. How did you feel? I mean, I, I'm assuming you're probably a little devastated. Uh, just saying, like, okay, I just. I didn't do what I wanted to do on Lake Anna. That was the place I thought I could make hay. Now I'm going to the title of Potomac. Another, so part of this story is 
Fancy Cooper Hobie BOS was locked. I think it was the first of April, which I guess was before Anna, right? Um, yes, I believe so. I, that entire event, it felt like I couldn't make a good cast. And every time I set the hook, my line snapped. And every time I made a cast a little too risky, it wrapped around the limb 15 times. Like it was just one of those days for all every day I was there. Um, so I started off my year like kind of downward and it felt like I really just couldn't get the ball rolling and going into Potomac, I'd already felt demoralized and I didn't do a lot of preparation. I, I really wish I had going back and I kind of knew going in, it was like, I'm going to be mad at myself if this doesn't work out. But I also had an attitude like the odds of me stumbling upon something here are pretty low just because I have so little time on the Potomac. And last year I did the season opener there and that was my first kayak tournament ever. And that went terrible. (laughs) So it was like, it's the Potomac. I'm just going to go fishing. Hopefully I can rely on that. And I still ain't figured that place out. I think that's the road. Um, The Potomac Potomac can be a cruel mistress. She really can. It's a crazy place and it's weird. I admire it so much. It's such a cool fishery. Um, and I w- wish I could get out there more, but it's one that I really got to get out and just pound it a couple times and figure out something that I can rely on. Um, there's been a couple deals fun fishing where I've had good success there, but as far as tournaments go, man, I'll fish those Potomac ones, but <laughs> right now it's definitely not one of my favorites to have on the schedule just as far as my own benefit you know but the thing is the more reps you get there even if you just fish two tournaments there one tournament there a year you're going to collect notebook and you're going to know what to do um and with that said just for the people that are listening on apple podcast spotify so right now what did you finish at lake anna i don't even know i think it was 24th 25th something in the 24th 25th something up there potomac river had to be DNF. <laughs> because then you got the next one that's on the docket, which was the Battle of Five Lakes, uh, the first one, because they're going to be doing uh, bo- or electric boogaloo for the for the last event of the year. Um, so you get the Battle of Five Lakes next. So you got a 24th place finish. Not great. Not bad. It's just kind of mid. The Potomac River, that was the big, you know, nuke, the one that really you really wish you'd have back. Now you're going to the Battle of Five Lakes. What is your mm-hmm. thought going into this? Which lake were you going to pick from? I picked the Res solely because I just didn't feel like figuring out any of them. And for this one, I don't want to say I treated it as a throwaway because it was already done and I knew my throwaway is going to be the Potomac probably. So I was like, I'm just going to go to the Res and I know I can't hang deep. Uh, that's just not my thing. Offshore, I really... I'm not as developed as I need to be, and I'm aware of that. It's something I need to work on. But uh, And I knew I wasn't going to be able to make enough practices up there to figure something out in something that's not my element. So I was like, I'm just going to go mess around shallow with a bunch of soft plastics, maybe a frog. And if I catch a limit, cool. If I don't, I'll have learned that you can't fish shallow with the red. <laughs> um, and I ended up catching probably – eight or nine fish in the morning in the grass up shallow, but they were all tens, elevens, mm-hmm. just not one more inch and I would have had a limit. It would have been great. But uh, unfortunately I didn't survive that one, but I just kind of treated that one as a learning experience. I did end up catch, catching nothing, one off a drop shot shallow on some wood. But what I learned from that one is I really do think if I put in the time and practice, I probably could have marked enough weird little shallow stuff that I could have made my own little deal. Because going in, I had this like defeatist mindset, like, oh, this isn't in my element, there's no chance. Like, I'm not catching a limit here. But I had a graph, I had everything I needed, it's just I hadn't put in the work, and I I really, after the Potomac, I was kind of in this dumpy mindset, like, man, this is just like last year, I haven't got it figured out yet. Um, But I just kept putting in time, and I was still putting in time, and the problem is, is that I go fun fishing, I pound them, then I get in a tournament and I get whooped. And it's like, oh, it's like, I know I can fish. Mm -hmm. It's just making adjustments and decisions and learning how to tournament fish, which is a whole different thing. Uh, And honestly, 
I feel like there's a lot of guys who can fish, but they just don't have that down fully pat too. Cause it's a hard thing to learn. It's um, yeah. It, that is such an interesting thing you bring up because it's almost like you have to be well-rounded to where you can survive on a bunch of places, but then you're good somewhere. Uh, you have to have something that you're really good at, uh, and then be well-rounded everywhere else. And that's generally the formula for it. When you look at the guys that really make it big time. Yes, sir. Uh, but you got a 50 second place, you know, there. Mm-hmm. So it's like, you got a 24th, a throwaway, a, a 50 second, which is not bad. And these are all places that you really don't feel great on. Yeah. And it was like, okay, I got a fish. That felt good for AOI points, and I've caught a keeper on the res. And as small as a gain as that might have been, it's a gain. And that's a big thing for me is I don't ever have to – I try as hard as I can, but recently especially, it's like whenever there's a bad day, I just try to learn. I'm a little bit better. It's a learning experience. And uh, I'm a big proponent of staying within your style. So it's like as far as somewhere on the res – Like, even if I'm having these surviving events, I really don't ever plan to go try to stick with the way people fish that normally, which I don't even really fully understand, to be honest with. Um, Like, that's just not in my wheelhouse. And I'm not saying I'm going to put my foot down and be like, I'm going to waste all my time every time I come here. (laughs) But uh, I'm a real big thing on you just need to do how you want to do it and how you need to do it. Cause it's like, if you're trying to fish like someone else, you can't catch another man's fish. It's just not going to happen. No, you can't do it. It's so hard to do that. Mm-hmm. So, uh, after that event, I was like, okay, now I have some, I can look forward to coming up. And I think the next one was small mouth. Mm-hmm. Right? And, uh, that me and a buddy, we went on the Potomac and did a float. I really wanted to do the Sanada because I kind of knew that it would be my majority one. That just place just has the fish, I feel like. Um, not that it couldn't be one somewhere else, but you really have to set up and do your homework and figure out the right stretch and put in the work. Um, but the Shenandoah is a hike for me. Um, and I was completely realistic about that. And at the time I was pretty busy. So I was like, I'm going to do the Potomac. It should be good enough to place. Well, you know, like I don't think any of the rivers on the choices that we had were the worst option. I think they were at least all in play really. Um, and that's the thing this club does really well about. Usually there's not a choice where you can screw yourself so bad. You can't even catch a limit. Usually they do a pretty good job of these multi events. They're pretty fair. Um, but I knew a lot of those guys on the Shenandoah, but whatever. I, I like smallmouth fishing. Uh, when I was getting away from the pond stuff, I started waiting for smallmouth. And that's when I really started to have my first real bass success on my own, really, hmm. before I even got into the tournament stuff. So, like, in a way, it feels like, okay, smallmouth. I probably don't have as much experience as some of the guys in the club, but to me, it feels like that's a strength and that's, you know, that's confidence is what matters in the end. And so I was like, all right, I can do this. And I ended up, I think I got a small limit. I don't think I ever found any bigger ones. I found them late in the day and they were all kind of on the bank doing weird, funky spawn stuff, but I got a limit and I was happy about that. And I was like, all right, because I'm, I'd been talking to a couple of my buddies in the club and they're like, Oh, it was fishing pretty rough today. I didn't get a limit. So I was like, okay. I mean, it was a little tough and I still got it. So that's, that's what I expected of that event, at least a limit. And I felt pretty comfortable there. Uh, and it came. Well, so you ended that event with a 26th place. Mm-hmm. You know, and that's what felt good. Cause it's like, okay, I can do something right. <laughs> it's like, I had my little spin out at the start of the season now we start to climb back up uh and i really as far as my style goes i like fish in the spring that's when i enjoy spring and fall are really my favorites uh i love wanting a crankbait i love fishing a spinnerbait um so i really was like going to the summer while i did good at that event i was like Ugh, i don't really love the summer <laughs> uh Cause they can get tough, like especially in August and July, but this year it hasn't been so bad. It's been pretty cool. Mm-hmm. We've gotten the same dog days. Like last year, it felt like by the time it was July, I mean, it was hot. Uh, 
this year it stayed a little cooler, I feel like. And uh, that definitely played into the coming events because when it gets dog days, the fishing changes a lot. Uh, that early summer period is just so different than late summer fishing. It Like, you can call the summer one thing, thinking of it as in bass fishing, but it really ain't. Like, it's got phases just like a spawn does, you know? It, it really does. And, and kind of just as we're building up guys to really the main event here it's just interesting when you look at it and then you flesh out the story of the the event you're looking the most forward to you got 24th place at which was not what you wanted then you get your teeth knocked in on the potomac river so you're not feeling great on this season next stop stop number three is the bronze back challenge okay you just hit a 26th place finish right there awesome so now you feel like there's something happening here you're not doing great you're not doing bad you're kind of just there and then you go to the battle of five lakes and then you hit a 50, a 52nd place. And so you're like, you're, you're mid, you're, you're, you have a good average right now. Uh, probably not what you want, but it's not a bad season easier. Even when you also bring into the, the, the fact that this is your second season. Yeah. That's kind of what's been keeping me together. Cause I set myself a very high standard. It's like, I already want to be there, you know? Um, Cause it's like, well, I've won events in the boat. And a co-angler, and as a co-angler, it's just like there's water in front of me, fish as best I can. Uh, and both of those events, I played a role in the win. So I was like, okay, well, I know that I can do something right. Uh, but the kayak and making my own calls is just a whole different deal. But I still wanted to be, it's like, how did I not do well at the tournament? I need to be doing well. I need to be blah, blah, blah. And I felt like I needed to be a lot further along than I was. Um you got to give yourself a break because you will go into slumps. You just will in this sport. And it, it really, it felt like earlier this season. And I felt like I kind of experienced the micro version of it last season. I kind of had a whole rebirth. It was like, okay, I'm a new angler now. I, I'm through that. This is, I did okay at the smallmouth event. I know how to fish. It's, we're back to where we were. It's okay. And uh, that was really, uh, you know, it's hard because it's like, oh, am I just getting lucky? But then you have such consistent success. It's like, well, I can't clearly be getting lucky, but it's like, I'm not a beast yet, but I'm still flunking some events. So it's like building a well-rounded profile where you can hang across the whole season ain't going to come in two seasons. Uh, but it's good that I can have some events where it's like, okay, well, I, I can hang with these northern guys who are on these fisheries all the time. Uh, and that's kind of what's going into the next one, which is the wrap, right? It's your wrap. And, and and just before we get into that, no, just to kind of like piggyback off what you said, it, it's hard. And I think the, the hardest part is our brains want to make it so black and white where if I put in this amount of work, this is what happens. And so his example is like in, in football or baseball or any other pro sport, you get up to a certain level and you, you expect certain success. And in fishing, you can be a pro angler and go fish a BFL and get your ass kicked. If you are an NFL player and you go down and play high school, you're going to just wreck. You're going to do well. Fishing is weird where it's like, it's not just like you're always going to have a certain success level. Even in your prime, it's going to be highs and lows, highs and lows, ups and downs. Exactly. It's a lot like you're just trying to keep the knife as sharp as possible, but you're using it all the time. So mm -hmm. it's constantly dulling. And that's kind of why I'm so big on time on the water. Um, I mean, like literally, like if I have to drive an hour both ways and get two hours in on somewhere like the wrap, I will, if I have to, just because it's like two hours over the course of five days, you add that up every single day, one little bit of gas money, but you have a lot more time fishing than you do. If you just put in even two 12 hour days on the weekend, mm -hmm. you know, just like exponentially more over a long period of time. And I think, you know, not everyone can do that just because of work or blah, blah, blah. But I'm just really big on if you get the chance after work, you should take it because it's like we only all have so much time, you know. So for me, it's like any moment I get, even if it's bank fishing, it's like as long as you're making casts, you're feeling bites, you're taking in info all the time. That's the best thing you can do, in my opinion. And with that said, we've arrived. So Rappahannock mm -hmm. Tournament what what were your thoughts going into it well i had just won the virginia kayak trail 
on the chick, and that's tidal. So I was like, okay. Um, and I don't hate tidal fisheries. They're funky. They're tough. But they can also produce some of the most epic moments you have in fishing just because of the windows and how things fish. And one thing I've always really liked about them is uh, because I'm so big on, you know, patterning fish and counting bites out and trying to figure out, like, what can I expect to be at at the end of this if I fish really clean? One thing you have to take into account when you're doing stuff like that is you really have to be aware of when things change. Like, are the clouds going to leave halfway through the day? Mm -hmm. Because if you do, you can't just act like they didn't. It's going to change things. Um, and that's one thing that's nice about tidal fisheries is obviously random wind can show up and block the tide. Yes. But that tide is the penultimate change. And if you aren't good at reading those conditional changes, because some of them are small, like some of them are just like the sun moving and the shadows changing and like keeping track of that is like you're getting too micro to be even be able to handle the changes like mm -hmm. keeping track of them. But it just depends on what kind of bite you're on. But tidal stuff makes that easy because it's like, okay, I know there's going to be a tide change and that's going to affect it. Even the start, middle, and end of a tide can change a deal throughout how you're fishing it. So it's like when you can count on that, you need to really use that to your advantage, in my opinion. It also really helps just to have a win or just to have a good finish going into this. You, you get that good vibes going into it, which is so important. Mm -hmm. And the tournament before that was Virginia kayak trail on Dyson reservoir. And I had done really well pre-fishing, but I had one of those events where you literally hook all the winning fish, but you lose them. And like, you know, you don't fish clean. So it was like going into the next event. I was like, I need to fish clean. I need to be sharp. And I did. And then it happened. I won. And I went into this event. It's like, okay, tidal fishery on the club. Like that I really care about, you know, I fished the VKTs when they're near Richmond but it, it's more like a fun, chill tournament. It's like a step away from like, okay, it's time to compete in NBKBA, you know. That's when I really want to put the stuff down. And there's still events where I'm lazy and I don't end up pre-fishing or something like that, where it's like I just want to go fun fishing around the where I live. Like the res, it's like a, it's just a pain driving all the way up there and fishing something that's not in my style that I don't like doing. But uh, it's important to put in that time but there ends up being events like that still, unless I'm razor focused. And next season, hopefully I will be. But who knows? It's hard to keep yourself accountable when you're driving mm -hmm. up there, especially on I-95. Uh, but I knew, okay, this is one. A couple of the ramps were about an hour from me. We haven't been here before. Those are both good things. Uh, and I, I didn't think a lot of the guys in the club fish this fishery. A lot of them don't. Um, so I felt like it was a pretty even playing field. Uh, down my way, we got the Pamunkey, Mattapanai, the Chick, the James. There's plenty of tidal water. I know tidal water uh, just because of the area and where I fish and how that's affected how I fish. And so I was like, okay, I'm just going to go in and mess around. Uh, and I had a lot of days lined up for practice. Like, it was nice. I had, like, three weekends where it was like, I'm smooth sailing. I can get at least a full day in. And then disaster strikes. Oh, no. Uh, so I get one full day in. I fish with my buddies, which is always nice. It's nice to have guys who you can convene with at the end of the day and bounce ideas off of, even if you aren't stylistically the same. It's nice to have like, a, okay, there's a thing going on here on the river just to be able to try to piece the entire puzzle together. And so I got one full day. Uh, I'd been catching them on a frog. And I'd caught some pretty good fish. I probably had like 60 to 70 inches of fish over like three or four fish. I think it was four, maybe it was, no, it was five and three of them were good ones and I had two small ones, I think. And I was like, okay, I think for the limit you need to win this, it's probably going to be around 85, 90. I, I don't know the rap well. I hadn't been there at all before this, but I've been catching them pretty good. And I was like, all right. That's cool. But the problem was, is there were thunderstorms every afternoon that entire week and the week after that. Uh, and I really don't like to count on a frog deal when it's thundering like that, because I just feel like it pushes them out of that grass and stuff. And I don't think they like to be up 
being all aggressive, chasing stuff like that when there's thunder hours before, you know. So I was like, I don't want to count on that. Uh, I'm going to go and I planned the next weekend. I wanted one full day of real practice and one day I was just going to chase snakeheads to get it out of my system. I didn't want to be distracted by them. Got to scratch that itch, man. Yeah. And with the frog deal, I was catching like five snakeheads per bass. Dang. So it was like I was weeding through all these tiny snakeheads just to find the bass, which was annoying. And that's another reason I didn't count on that early, early practice. Hmm. Um, and so I thought that deal was messed up and probably gone anyway. So I was like, all right, this weekend's the weekend. I go out on the first day. I'm like, this is going to be a snakehead day because I like the tide a little better the next day. And as I'm making my way down to the spot, uh, and just so everyone knows, I've been practicing mid-river. I'm not going to give away the ramp I launched out of, but I'm just going to say it's a popular one and it's mid-river. <laughs> you can't figure out from that. Oh. <laughs> um, but I'm starting making my way down, and I have a Hobie Pro Angler now. Oh, okay. Um, what size? 12 or 14? 12, 180. Um, if you see a papaya Hobie, it's probably me. <laughs> I see a lot of guys with that color. I'm thinking I'm going to upgrade to 360 this winter, but I want to keep the papaya so bad because now everyone's like, hey, that's Scott over there. <laughs> it's your colors, but, man. Yeah. and uh, But whatever. That's the side thing. Um, I'm going down the river and, you know, tidal fisheries, there's just junk everywhere, especially the wrap. Um, some of the other ramps, there's so much junk that it's hard to even touch the bottom. And I checked out a couple ramps the previous weekend. So this weekend I'm talking about is the final weekend I had for practice. I checked out two different ramps. I didn't really like them. So I ended up on that middle ramp and that's the one I picked. I was like, this is what I, I like how it looks. That's all I really had to work off of. It looked pretty. It looked like what I expected the wrap to look like. Um, and so I decided, all right, let's go snakehead fishing. And I was just pedaling down the channel and boom, stump. My stuff was bent out bad. Mm. <laughs> uh, I screwed up and I broke off the entire boom mast, which is the plastic part that holds the fin. Uh, and at this point, I'm like, man, my season might be screwed. <laughs> I'm a week out and I don't have my drive and I probably could fish it with a paddle, but you really don't want to paddle a big old pedal kayak. It's not mm. fun. Um, but I'm like, if I have to fish it paddling, I will. Um, but luckily I was able to overnight, uh, the part and, uh, I replaced it. I was like, okay, sweet. Close call, but we're saved. Yeah. I lost pretty much all my practice, but whatever. <laughs> You, you know, whatever. I've seen the place. I know what it looks like. I I know the areas. And I've messed around enough that I had enough stuff that I could probably work with a little bit. I have some context clues. Aside from the frog thing, that practice, I had also figured out a deal with creek mouths. But that's kind of always there on tidal stuff. You know, creek mouths always play, especially on the rap, it seemed like. Because a lot of those creeks were just grassed up, at least at the landing I was at. Um, that's impressive that you recover from that because if I, if I messed up my boat or kayak, I would be stressing out and having a lot of negative energy going into the event. You are going to love the tournament day stories. Oh gosh. <laughs> For sure. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, from there I'm like, all right, well, I guess I'm just going to show up day of, um, and, uh, night before I really, I probably shouldn't have, but I went out with the buddies and you know, I'm 21. So I try to take advantage of my youth and the fact <laughs> silly stuff like go out the night before and fish a tournament the next day. But I slept in a little. Um, I showed up at the ramp probably 10 minutes before the event started and I was all stressed out and I was like, man, I really shouldn't have gone out, blah, blah, blah. I'm like, all right, whatever. I don't have any practice anyways. We're just going to get out there and go. But the ramp was a zoo. Um, um, like 20 boat bass tournament, if I had to guess, I was just glancing. Uh, and they all looked like they knew the rap pretty well. You know, you can kind of just tell when it's like local guys, you know, they just look confident. Yeah. Like the way they're standing, they're all kind of posturing with their ego right before blast off. Everyone's like ready to go catch them. And I was like, yeah, these are definitely like local guys. Like this is a local club. You could kind of tell. And so I was like, all right, I'm just going to go past them, try to stay out of their way. Uh, there were a lot of kayakers at the ramp I was at. 
But tidal fishery, a lot of times, I mean, I've fished the Mattapanai and the Pamunkey, which, you know, not crazy tournament fisheries, but when you have a tournament, it's usually packed. Like, it's, they don't fish big, mm-hmm. especially in bigger fields. And the chick pressured, you know, you fit, see a, a good amount of boats a lot of the time. So I figured, whatever. It's people, you know, it's not like I'm going to get away from them now. That's tidal fishing too. Like every tidal fishery you go to and almost like every lake nowadays, but especially tidal, they're going to be packed and they fish small. You're going to have these clusters of people. That's just the way they set up. You know, there's a lot of dead water in the tidal fishery, I feel like. Um, And it's kind of just like, not even because a lot of it's just bad water, but it's hard to it's easy on a lake to be like, Oh, that's juice. Like you just look at a lay down and you're like, that's a good lay down. Uh, on tidal fisheries, there's lay downs everywhere. There's stuff that looks good everywhere. Yeah. But I is king. And, uh, you can't get caught up in fishing stuff just cause it looks really good. Cause a lot of stuff looks good. I mean, how far did you, you have know? to paddle to get to your first spot? And well, that's part of what I'm going into. So I figure I'm going to be like, all right, well, I'm probably not going to get to one of these Creek mouths early enough, but, I think it was, we were going into rising tide at the start of the morning, I believe. And uh, that was, it was kind of on a falling tide deal. So I was like, all right, there's some creeks up here. I'm going to make my way up and then I'm just going to fish around. Maybe go flirt around in them. Maybe my frog deal will be there. Maybe it won't. Um, You know, it's a tidal place. I don't like to count on anything too much tidal. It just changes so much. Even counting on bites which is something that i really like to do and most of the time when i'm having a good day it's because i'm sharp and i'm able to be like all right this deal i can count on one or two an hour i count on four fish an hour one of them will probably have size just being able to set myself up to limit good and usually when i have a good day that's how it goes i count it all out and everything goes as i expect and i fish clean and i land them all Going into this, I didn't want to count on anything too much just because it's tidal. Um, so I'm like, all right, I'm just going to make my way up to the spot. It was probably two miles, not too far in a pedal mm-hmm. kayak. But I decided I'm going to fish my way there instead of just going there. Smart. Okay, interesting. Uh, just because it looked nice, the way the wa- the amount of water that was on the laydowns. And, you know, you can kind of see, like, when the, wa- the wood is breaking the water, how much wake it's given, how hard the current's going. Um, and at the wrap, at almost every single time I went, I had a hard time reading the current. Um, somewhere like the Potomac, where it's a huge river, you can kind of feel the current pretty strong. Like, it's hard to not know what tide it is mm. or going into. On the wrap, there were a lot of days where it felt like either it was getting caught somewhere by wind or something was happening that wasn't happening to a T what the chart said. I never had a day where to a T the chart was like, yeah, this is what it is. And it was that. So I was like, all right, the tide can be a little funky as far as timing goes. I really need to be paying attention to what I feel like it's at. I can't trust the chart and just be like, this is where we're at. I need to really look at the water and try and figure out myself where my spot in the river is at tidal wise. And uh, it was definitely rising. And so I was like, all right, um, as far as tidal water i really like to have a couple of little deals that i've found and can go back to and reload on and you know just have like spots where i fish that specifically and then i break off and go to another spot that's kind of how i always i like to bounce around a lot anyone who saw me tournament day i was pedaling nonsense i run around all the time i just go 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 and so i was running all over the place but i like to like hit spots go back hit spots go and you know just A lot of the water in between, it's hard to just go down a stretch of bank and be like, all right, I'm going to catch multiple fish. A lot of them are just kind of like weird nothing fish that just kind of appear on tidal water, it feels like. And to be able to find those can be kind of hard to find a deal where it's like I can just go down the bank, fish in a stretch and catch them. Sometimes you'll have a stretch and the tide's hitting it right, and that's like a little deal you can hit. But to just go fishing and just go down the bank it can be pretty tough sometimes. So I started out in the morning and I feel like for those weird in between spots bites, when you're just fishing down the bank in between spots, it's nice to have top water because it's like they either hit it or they don't, Mm -hmm. you know? 
as far as fishing it, it's hard to not fish it clean. You know, you, it's just on top. I mean, you're not going to hang up in any junk. So you can be pretty effective. And it just feels like they come out of nowhere. Like if you can't really pinpoint where they're at real well, like I like to be able to be like, oh, they're all on the shaded side of the cypress tree on the isolated ones and go catch that pattern and go catch those fish. But for this, it was like, with the way I was catching them, it was like, I'm not going to be able to do that. Like, I can't just go be like, they're all on this type of tree, you know? It was like, I just got to go down the bank. And so I start throwing a buzz bait, uh, hmm. a mega bass Jamaica boa. Um, Interesting color. What color is that? It's just a gray. Um, huh. I'm big on grays. Um, I think a lot of people throw white and the <laughs> fish see white a lot. So I, there's a color water i like for white you know that like glowing white mm -hmm. but almost any other time i like to go gray as long as it's not like a swim jig or something like as long as it has something where it's like you know as a buzzer they're not gonna have trouble finding it but when they get up to it i don't want them to see white and be like that's fake and swim away mm. that's what i think's going on a lot of times and when i was practicing i saw two or three boats that had multiple people in them and they were all throwing buzz baits. So I was like, I know people are throwing buzz baits on the wrap. So it must work, but I don't want to look like everyone else. Um, and personally, I feel like it's kind of hard to find a good buzz bait on the market right now. Um, I kind of compare it to spinner baits. It's like, go try to find a good spinner bait. There's 20 of them. You know, there's so many good spinner baits nowadays. Then you go look for buzz baits and it's like to find a normal good components it does something that sets itself a little apart it's kind of hard um and i really like this one my only problem with it is it's really big i really try to downsize on rivers most of the time but i figured you know there's some big fish on the wrap and i think to be able to win the event i was going to need at least one that was going to be above like 16 like you can't i didn't think i was going to be able to win just catching a bunch of 16s or whatever so I figure I'm going to try to look for a kicker and I immediately like, it must have been within my first 20 casts that I, I caught an 18 just fishing down the stretch all the way to the creek mouth. And so I was like, okay. That's a good way to start. Like, yeah. Even if that's a nothing fish, it's a good start, you know? Um, so I keep on it, but I was really careful because I was like, it's easy to get caught up in this like, oh, topwater fish are easy. So I'm just going to fish this. I was not going to die with this thing. And I knew that the moment I got that 18. And so I was really careful the entire time I was fishing it. I didn't want to waste any more time than I needed to. Smart. But obviously you don't want to lose out on fish if the deal's still going. Mm -hmm. So I keep fishing it. And I think, yeah, I caught three more on this before I even got to the creek mouth. And so I'm like, okay, there's a buzz bait deal, but I need to watch that tide. Because once that goes slack tide, I almost guarantee it's going to die. Uh, what do you know it did? <laughs> uh, part of the thing I liked about this buzz bait is the blade is huge, um, at least for what I like in a buzz bait. But the weird thing about it is it feels like with this one, something about the shape of the blade or something about it, it feels like you can really get seven or eight different sounds out of it, depending on how you're retrieving it. And I really like that because I'm a guy who will go from one or two buzz baits to another, like... I'll switch to the same bait just to see if they're on one with a clacker or not, just to make sure before. That has a massive blade on it, for sure. That thing is massive. But with this one, it's like, okay, I can cover eight different buzz bait sounds with one buzz bait, just depending on how I'm retrieving it. So I can kind of check up on all these sounds and figure out which one they want. Hmm. And if I wanted a specific one. I don't know how to describe which one it was. I mean, I can't make buzz bait noises, <laughs> but... uh it was just something about the speed and it was doing a little bit of squeaking and a little bit of that classic buzz. And it was just, there was a very sweet spot where if I reeled at the right speed, it would really seem to be that. And I would just put it as close to the wood as I can. All the limbs and blowdowns that were in the water, I just try to parallel it. If I could smack the wood with the blade, I would. Hmm. Um, I had a couple bites and it just felt like they were hiding behind the log in the current and they were just coming up and... And I didn't have a single bite where it was like a lame bite. They were just killing it. So I knew that that's what they wanted. Um, Did you fish a travel hook with, or a stinger hook with it? Nope. Uh, I'm really big on, for me, it's either stinger 
or trailer. Because if it's Stinger, I just want them to be catching it like they, you know, like they swipe a crankbait and they get caught with the hooks. It's like you get that advantage. Um, and that's nice if you're not around anything heavy. That's true. But that's on true. both spinner baits and buzz baits, if I'm not running that, I need to run a trailer. Like it's just a thing where it's like I it'll bug me. Because I like to have something where they can suck it in, you know. Just having that bulk. Mm-hmm. And I think also, like on this, I got a green pumpkin spunk shad. Hmm. Uh, I really think the spunk shad is kind of a slept on bait in every regard. Because it's like, for so long I've wanted a trailer that I can just... It's like, okay, I have that bulk, but I don't want a paddle tail because that's messing up action. I don't want a crawl because that's also messing with the action a little bit. This does nothing to the action, but it gives you bulk and profile. So it's like you can have an advantage trailer with not really a downside. You have and- guts, though, because honestly, I, I always feel like if I throw a spinnerbait without a trailer... I'm telling myself that evening about you remember that fish you missed because you were a dumbass. You didn't put a trailer on it, but it, it makes sense. though. if you're around really thick shit, yeah, you know, do that. But I feel like when you're skipping a dock or something like that and you can get away with it, put a, a stinger hook or something on there because they will short strike it every now and then. For me, it's also a lot of I, I like to really pay attention to and it's hard because a lot of the stuff I do. It's, I'm very in my head all the time, and it's like I'm trying to pick up on subtle stuff, but if you read into t- anything too much, it's going to spin you out. Yeah. Um, and just watching how they eat things or feeling it, I-, I pay attention to that stuff. I take notes. It's like, did that feel like it was a, r- a real patternable? But like sometimes it just like you can feel it in the rod. It's like, this is a pattern. Like I just found, like I've only caught one, but I can kind of feel it. Like it's like a weird, intangible thing. And with this, it was like, they're on it like i after the second one i was like, it's a weird okay. gut feeling isn't it when things are about it, to like go down <laughs> like and it's just one of those things where it's like you're i it feels like i just have like a, a sixth gear and it's like if i can get there i'm fishing the best i've ever fished but getting there is hard you know it's like you gotta kind of have it feels like i almost have to have a couple things go my way and then it's like okay now it's boom i'm in the zone and now i'm fishing like a beast and it's like why can't I be like this all the time? Why can't I just show up and let the dog out? Fishing is weird, and it's a lot about your mind. It really is. That's kind of one of my favorite things about it. It's, you know, there's no laws. It's like, you can be good, you can be bad, whatever. Um, But anyway, caught four on this, and then we hit slack water. Okay, so what time of day is it when you hit slack water? Uh, I think where I was, it was about 11, 10 or 11. Okay, so you're... It, uh, 10, 30, 11 o'clock, you got four in the boat. They're all keepers, correct? Yes, okay. but I'm also very aware of how much trouble I'm in because for a lot of the day, I was leading the event. Oh, shit. And I'm not one of those guys who can just turn off the leaderboard. I got to know, and partially it's just for my own enjoyment. Like, I I become an anxious wreck, but I also, like, enjoy it. Like, it's just like having guys on my tail, especially when I recognize the names, and it's like, I know this guy knows how to fish tidal water. And he's right on my tail. That is the biggest thrill I've ever experienced. Pers- like kayak fishing is the only place you experience that too. It's like you get the tournament thing and you get to like feel it live. Who's in the lead. Mm-hmm. So cool. Uh, but I knew guys were on my tail and I knew I was in trouble. Uh, and I think one point in the day, one of the guys got five before I did. And then I was like, all right, we really need to kick it into gear. But what I've been doing, I was just bouncing back and forth between the almost all the way back to the ramp there's a certain point where it kind of got better water than the rest like you just tell looking at it and i was like all right i'm gonna go to that point right before the ramp and i'm gonna go back to the creek mouth and i just kind of kept bouncing and like i'd explore a little of you know i'd cross over and hit a little pocket you know just poking around at stuff because now my buzz bait thing is gone i need to find something new and it really seemed like a lot of the people's bites died with that tide always Um, does like they were on that high tide morning thing and when it switched the leaderboard really slowed down but i was still worried i wasn't in lead anymore and i only had four but Uh, you also got to think and this is maybe it's because i'm basically it's so weird am i am i river rat or am i not i grew up basically fishing the potomac for high school tournament stuff and you know if you have four and you still got a good tide coming it's gotta be like dude this is 
I'm going to have one more bite window and all I need is one. That is exactly the thing I was worried about. Though, really? It, like everyone I was talking to, they were all anticipating the late tide, the low tide. They were like, oh, I really think it's going to turn on and it's going to be a slugfest. And I had four or five people. I don't know if they talked to each other and like it was just a shared thing, but like multiple people said that to me. So then I'm sitting in this position. I'm in now second with four good ones. And I'm like, all right, I need one more to really seal this thing in. But I don't have anything. The good tide's coming up and they might all catch up to me. It might be a total war. You know, you never know on a tidal body of water because it's windows. And, you know, all one guy has to do is find the right spot during the right water hitting it. And that's all he has to do to find and catch up to you. So I was sweating a little bit. But I also felt good and I was fishing good. So it's like I'm in the comfort zone. Um, with the buzz bait throughout the day, I've been trying other stuff. I threw a swim jig around a little bit. Hmm. Um, I threw a crank bait. I really like to rely on a square bill in tidal water. It feels like one of those things where it's just most of the time it's there in one way or another. Um, and I tried to pop her a little. I wanted to see if I could squeak one up. But I felt like if the popper thing was happening, I feel like more people probably would have been catching them because I saw other people throwing poppers, whether they're in the bass boat or the kayak. Um, and throughout the day, I'm talking to people. I'm seeing them. And they're, they're like, oh, you're doing well? I'm like, yeah, blah, 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 blah. And I hate it. It feels like they always want to talk to you when you're – I'm like in the lead, and I don't want to be like, oh, yeah, I'm leading right now. <laughs> but uh, what are you catching on? What are you catching them on? And I'm like, I don't really want to tell you. But uh, – at this point, I'm like, all right, I need to figure something else out. And I tried multiple different things, and I really didn't feel confident in any of them. I didn't feel like a bite was going to come. So like that that weird, those weird in-between areas where, like, if you were just to fish them, you probably wouldn't catch a limit. Uh, I was going through those, and I was like, I need to pull out a trick. Like, I need something sneaky to squeeze a fish out of one of those areas because I wasn't really sure that I was going to be able to find something on that low tide deal. Cause one, another thing about this is when I got to the Creek mouth, I didn't actually fish it because there were three boats on it and there were three boats on the other one and there were three boats on the one after that. <laughs> so it was like, I'm not going to try to squeeze in there and fight those guys for that. I don't care. I don't think there's enough fish there for all three of them anyway. Um, Cause I'd been catching them at the Creek mouth on like a little swim bait and a shad wrap just like you know a normal creek mouth tiny finessey thing deal but it was like i was multi-species fishing it was like 14 16 snakehead carp catfish 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 12 inch catfish snakehead like it was like it wasn't you know something where like i wanted to spend all my time there trying to wade through all those catfish finding bass so i was like i'm just gonna bounce back and i think in this stretch I'll be able to find one. I keep breaking away and messing with stuff, though. That was important. Because while you have to put time into stuff to figure stuff out and get the bite, sometimes you'll make that one or two casts with just the bait because you have a feeling, and then you'll hook one, and then it shows its hand to you. Mm -hmm. I never found that. Well, actually, with what I'm about to go into, I guess because of some of the stuff that happened later in the day, I could have found that. But at this point, I'm kind of stressed out. We're still in slack tide. And then, thunk. You'll never guess what I hit. <laughs> Another Oh, slump gosh, and dude. Come on. Out my drive. The opposite fin. Mm. Good part was I didn't break the plastic part. I just bent the fin. So, like, my fins were like this. And so I couldn't pedal. And I was like, this is not good. Um, but I have four. And I. I was really close to spinning out, but I was just enough in that zone where I was like, what, what, what time is it now? What time is it? Probably 1120, I think, is when that happened. Shh. I remember texting my mom about it and my girlfriend. I was like, this ain't good. <laughs> um, and so I immediately take my tiny little paddle with the T head on it. And I'm like shoveling water like, I got to get back to the ramp. I get back to my truck and in there I knew I had my tools from work and I take my 18 ounce sheet metal hammer and I open up the bed of my uh, bed or the tailgate of my bed and I put the drive down and I just start hammering 
my drive. I'm like, this is not <laughs> happening today. <laughs> I work that thing for a good 10 minutes and slowly it just bends into place. And I'm like, all right, let's go. <laughs> and uh, get her I done. Get the water. I'm like, man, I really, it was hard to pick something from there. It was like, I really don't like to slow down and drag stuff and fish finesse. It's something I can do. I know how to do it. You know, you kind of have to to be a tournament angler. How are you mentally right now? You beat the shit out of your prop. You had to take time out to pedal back to your boat. You're probably fuming. You got a lot of negative thoughts going on. You beat the shit out of it. That's a little therapeutic, actually. But now you're in the boat. Do you have this moment where you're like, okay. Yeah. Once I remember putting it back into the drive slot and I was like, ain't over yet. Uh, I looked down at my phone. The leaderboard's still the same. That was very good for my confidence. What time? I didn't have to worry about someone else wearing them out and like they were on them. I didn't. Oh no. Uh, I'm still sitting in second. It's all okay. I decide, okay, I need to get finesse, but I need to cover water. And what time is it now? Probably 1230 and low tide is starting to come out. Okay. Um, it was really slow getting going. So it's like still just drizzling out practically. Like it's just dripping water, barely coming out. Um, and so I'm thinking, man, I hate to rely on this stuff. Generally with a title deal, I like to be on craws or brim. Um, I don't like to rely on those little bait fish. I call them glass minnows just cause they're so tiny. You know what I'm talking about? They're like the tiniest bait in the world and on the wrap. Cause there's so much biomass. They're just everywhere. So it's like, it sucks to try to imitate them. The fish know what they look like. They're seeing them all the time. Mm-hmm. Um, and they're so tiny that it's, I don't want to say it's impossible, but it's really hard to imitate those minnows, um, especially because they're often schooled. Like if a bass were to come up, like if a four pounder comes up and bites in one of the schools, he's going to eat 15 of them. You know, it's not like you're fishing one bait. that's one of those minnows. It's hard. Um how big are they? Like just for people listening at home on, on Spotify like and Apple. An inch to half an inch. They are tiny and there's lots of them. Um, and so I don't even think about it as the same type of thing as shad, to be honest. I think a shad is a separate deal. Um, and there, you know, there's also the perch played a big thing, I think, in uh, the way it was setting up because there's a ton of white perch in that river. Much like the Potomac, I know you can get on some pretty specific Potomac white perch deals if you really seek it out. Mm-hmm. Um, but I didn't really read into that too much just because it's something I don't have a lot of experience doing. I don't want to go try to chase that bite because every forage is a little different if you're trying to key into one. If you're trying to be ambiguous, you can get away with doing some other stuff. But it's like if you're really trying to be a shad, you want to be bounce, 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 bounce. If you want to be a brim, you want to float, pause, float, pause, yep. you know. Just act like, you know, cross sneaking along the bottom. So I'm like, all right, I do have some title experience. So I have a couple tricks. Um, I only had one spinning rod in the boat because I really didn't plan to bring it out. Um, and just in case, I tied on a drop shot. And one thing I really like to do is I take the smaller size of the Mega Bass Hazardong Shad and I drop shot that. That's one of the best glass minnow presentations you could ever do, in my opinion, because it's just so tiny, just like those minnows. Not a lot of hardware going on, and it's just swimming through the middle of the water column. But I didn't want to go to that because I knew that, like, those white perch were aggressive, and if I went throwing that out, I'm going to be weeding through those. Oh, I, yeah. really <laughs> I just wanted to catch the bass. I wanted to find that final keeper before I even thought about anything else. So I tied on uh, this underspin. This is a Gamagatsu mini underspin. This is a new one they put out. There used to not be a lot of underspins on the market. It's gotten a lot better, I feel like. Yeah, it has. But uh, this is just a quality one. They did a real good job. The hook's a little big. This is the size one uh, on the mini head. And this is a 5 uh, And then I got a Big Bite Baits Suicide Shad. And I think this is a three and a half just because the tail's so long three and a half but it's okay. a smaller size um and this is a little itty bitty thing i mean it's not big um have you have you really, fished an underspin before on tidal or was this just a completely first time doing it i've definitely done it before because for me it's like if you're gonna try to go over those 
go for those that little deal where it's going to be those you're imitating those glass minas. You really need to go small. And one thing is the color of this spoon. It doesn't look as clear as it is on camera, but it is really like not as opaque as it looks. Like it is almost see through. It looks except very really the back. Wow. The hollow body, so it's you know it's really clear and you can hardly even see it going through the water with the color it was. It was almost a little muddy and stained. So it was like, all right, I don't really want to be throwing something like that in muddy water. But the thing was, is like, okay, let's just imagine that it's too clear and they don't see the bait. Then they're just seeing this underspin going, and that's even closer to the glass minute size that I'm looking for. Hmm. So it's like, in a way, it's kind of just a little spinner bait blade on a hook and if they're seeing this, great, because it looks really realistic. I mean, it's got a big, beautiful eye. It's really, it's got a little purple sheen to it. I mean, it looks good. Um, so I was like, I'm just going to wind this around on my uh, on the rod, my casting rod. And I figured this will probably conjure up a bite. And if it doesn't, I still have the drop shot thing where I felt like I could at least catch a 12. Um, I end up hooking around one or I think it was around one. I hooked that 14 I need and the rod just loads up and it felt awesome. And I, it was a real victorious moment, but then low tide started to get going. So I was like, uh, I don't 80 inches. I mean, it's a good bag probably for this fishery considering these guys don't know it that well. I don't know it that well. So it's kind of a level playing field. We're not going to catch the piss out of them and get a bag that deserves, you know, like what the true weight should be for a win. Cause you know, unless you stumble upon something. So I was like, I might get lucky and survive with 80 inches. Um, and it ended up going that way. I mean, I didn't put another one on the board. Uh, the rest of the day was really slow. I don't think the low tide thing happened like it was supposed to. One thing that did upset me, though, is on my way back, I think it was probably the last 30 minutes of the tournament, out of nowhere... I fish a little bit deeper. At this point, I had pushed off a little bit so I could fish a little bit more of the deeper of the water. Now that the tide's coming out and I can fish some of the stuff you can't really see. Um, and I'm just winding this stuff, this over it. And boom, big hit. And it just starts ripping drag. I'm oh, like, God. Right, like a flathead or something. Something dumb. Yeah. Like, whatever. But I'm going to fight it out. You know, you never know. Uh, and it ends up being a smallmouth. I. You know, weird. I'd caught a 12 incher in practice. I knew they were there, but this was a bigger smallmouth. <laughs> I thought, like, going in during that weekend, I'd planned to try to check up and just see, like, can you target bigger smallmouth and, like, consistently do that as a thing? Because I don't know a lot about the river. And I didn't know if that was, like, a deal you can get on. I just wanted to mess around with it. I didn't have the time to. Evidently, there's at least one there. <laughs> and I. I got him boat side. He was like a 17 or 18 inch smallmouth. Like this is a big smallmouth, like a tidal fishery. How he even got up this far, like where I was at, I was like shocked. I was like, and I was almost so shocked that I think that's why I didn't get the net fast enough. Like I was like, uh, what? And I grabbed the net and he just comes up and he shakes, shakes, shakes. Gone. Like a smallmouth would do. And I watched the hook pull out of his tiny mouth and swam <sighs> off. Mm. And that really sucks because it would have been cool to win with a mixed bag. And it really would have been because I felt like 85 ish -ish inches where it would have put me at would have been like, this is what should win here today. I felt like so So it sucked because I didn't get like what I felt like was the true winning bag, but it was enough. And so I can't really complain too much. That that throws me for a loop a little bit. How I don't want you to give away the spot, but once you say a small mouth, you're kind of up river where it's not super, it's not super salty. Mm -mm, it's yeah. still pretty fresh. Yeah, no. It, I had talked to a couple fellas who'd fished like down towards where you get closure to that stuff, and they're like, yeah, there's like crabs down there like you see on the James. And I was like, okay. So there's like a section of the river that's like that. And then I knew that the other end of the boundary, it gets a little rockier, more yeah. like the upper wrap, and it's like, okay, this feels a little bit more smallmouthy. Up near Fredericksburg. Yeah, that's where I wanted to go check up on them. I didn't get the time to. Down here, it looked more like Potomac Pamunkey 
Matt and I chick. Like it looked tidily. Like it looked great. Tidily, yeah. Yeah. Lay downs. It, you know, you know how it looks. And I was shocked. I was like, how? Just how? Like it was so cool. But That's so crazy. I just wish I had put him on the board because that would have been an awesome one to have in the winning bag. Or a GoPro, because that'd been just cool to see yeah, your reaction to yeah. that. See, I really I really want to set one up just so I can have moments like that. I could be like, look at that. That's crazy. That actually it, happened. But uh, yeah, it was just a, I feel like a really classic uh, tidal win, you know, buzz bait in the morning, little finesse swim bait in the afternoon. What specifically with that little swim bait? I mean, if, if a small mouth is in play, you're not flipping pads or, or grass mats. So what were you specifically targeting with that underspin? That's another interesting part. I was right where there was a big curve in the river and I on my fish finder, most of the time I have my grass off because I'm like practically schizophrenic about like the pinging that it puts off and up shallow, like it needs to be off or I go insane. Like I'm like, I'm not going to catch any fish. I'm not going to catch any fish. <laughs> Um, I really use it for maps mostly, but at this point I had it pushed off a little more, so I turned it on. And it was in the bend, and it was a little bit steeper of a channel, and I knew there was some wood. And it, I'm not the best at reading the graph, but it looked like there was a little bit of rock down with it. And I kind of just dragged it low and slow over that stuff, and the rod just loaded up. And I was like, you know, that makes sense. Like, it's a little micro smallmouth habitat within the tidal stuff. Mm-hmm. That makes a lot now, of sense. Huh. That stuff is probably pretty hard, but I thought that was very cool that he was, that fish is able to sustain in that stretch of river. And obviously, I mean, he was like thick, like he wasn't like a, like he was starving and in the wrong place or something. He looked good. Like I wanted to really land him because he was a pretty fish. I mean, and I, that's impressive, dude. That it, That's really cool. <laughs> yeah, no, I, honestly, that's kind of part of why i just hope this place ends up you know obviously i'm the winner it's like of course i want to fish this place next year but it's a cool fishery and it has the ramps to sustain the club you know like the size so i just i hope it ends up on the schedule again because it didn't really turn out that good this time but i think if we went in like the fall or the spring mm -hmm. it could be really good um so would you fish the rappahannock for the bronzeback challenge next year or would you still see, go shenandoah I last year and the float i was doing i was actually fishing the rapidan which is the tributary of the rappahannock and i did really well every single time i practiced but then there was rain and it got all clayed up so that kind of bit me bad because i hadn't seen it after rain and it was just like clay slurry for the entire river and i didn't catch a fish mm. so i'm kind of I don't want to go there again if there's no rain. I don't want to count on it, but I don't think the Potomac. I think the Potomac would have played better money than it would have. I think the Doe would have too. So it's kind of like I definitely kind of want to check out that upper wrap stretch now, though, because it's like clearly if there's some size to them down there in their actual habitat, there should really be. Uh, it's definitely something I'm gonna check out though. Uh, I really love the wrap now, though. I. <laughs> Or, but it is a cool place. There's just so much life. Yeah, and dude, and back to pack wins. You know, Scott, you claim it was 79 inches. You're really good in the points. And then I, I want to make sure we touch base on this. Is after winning this thing, which is I guess a week ago now, mm -hmm. you made a hell of a drive to the New River. Yeah. Well, well hell of a drive might be a little strong uh, for me. An hour is nothing. Three hours is when I start to be like, all right, it's a little drive. Five is when I'm like, all right, it's a drive. But for me, I was like, all right, it's three hours. It's a cool place. Send it. You know, I'd never been there. Uh, I got a lot of buddies who have fished it and they said it's awesome. So I was like, well, let's see. So w was this spontaneous? Was this because you already won one? So you, so you decided to do this one or did you already plan on doing it? No, I was planning on dipping my toes into the upper level stuff just to see how I would do there. You know, I just wanted to see because... Really, the Hobie BOS and the Bassmaster uh, kayak trail, I think that's where the best guys are. You know, there's probably some local guys who stay local who are undoubtedly, like, really good and don't fish those. But as far as the strongest feel, that's who I yeah. want to stack myself up against. Uh, Santee, I did that one. It was a mess, and I wasn't really ready for anything about that. And uh, so I didn't really get a taste, and I was kind of mad about it. I was like, well, I... 
paid the entry fee. I did all the travel stuff. I put all this money in. I didn't even get a seat. Uh, this event, I was like, all right, let's get some redemption. I definitely planned to just because it was under five hours. I was like, all right, this is a sure bet. Um, and so day one, I didn't even get any practice. I planned to, but my shuttle service uh, canceled on me. And my brother was like, hey, man, I'll just wade fish up there. It looks awesome. I'll shuttle you. And I was like, sweet. That works out. Um, can't really get better than that. You know, <laughs> you have yeah. your own guy you can call and be like, go to this ramp instead. That's, I mean, that's handy. Uh, but the first day I show up, I do this float. I'm the only one there. It's two miles and I did it four times. And I had a great day. Um I think the leader was at 81 inches. I was at about 75, so pretty small deficit. I was sitting in like 14, 100% still in play. But you yeah, know? how does that make you feel where it's like you just signed up to fish a bass open and day one, and how much practice did you have again? Just make none. sure. None. <laughs> none. <laughs> river. So you sign up for the Bassmaster Open, so to speak, and you're in the top 20 day one. Yeah. That's um, got to be like what the hell's going on? I just well, won on the chick. I just won on the rap. Yeah, it really feel. And honestly, the guy I bought my Hobie from, he had only taken it out four times and every single time was on the new river. So like I had some like superstition going in. I was like, this is it. I'm going pro. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, evidently not. Uh, but it definitely, it's been feeling like everything's coming together. Uh, and a big thing for me is I have a lot of, because I'm so in my head all the time, I have a lot of nerves about it. Um, and keeping myself in check is important. Uh, my girlfriend does a really good job the whole way there. She is very good at anytime something happens. It's She's good about keeping me on the train tracks. Uh, so shout out to her. But the first day I was like, okay, um, I can do this. Like it, I'm going to keep doing this. Uh it felt really good because it just felt like everything was coming together because it felt like I had put in so many hours, so many hours. It's like when you're fishing almost every day, you can feel yourself putting in the time and I'm like so sharp, fun fishing. And it's just like, it doesn't make sense that I'm not able to make the calls in the tournament because I put in so much work and it doesn't make any sense like you were talking about earlier. It's like as a human, your brain's just like, why? Like, mm -hmm. This sucks. Doesn't like, make what? sense. And you're like so confused about it. But then it all kind of crescendoed at once. And it's like, okay, I've at the very least solved like the formula that works for me stylistically as far as making adjustments and making calls. It's just the balance I needed to figure out between my head, which is just like a totally like I'm just always going like thinking about fishing something, something, something down to like the color or whether or not my bait has a shad dot and how the fish is eaten and how he was positioned and all these little tiny things to the macro of, of, okay, my gut says this isn't the time for that. My gut says it's happening here. Don't die with this fish free here. Stay on this. It might come back. Just figuring out what the balance was for me. And I think for other people, just knowing and talking to other guys, it feels like it's going to be different for everyone. And it's just like one of those things where it's like, okay, you got to put in time on the water you got to figure out what works for you. Um, and that's hard because like you can't look to, you can't go on YouTube and be like, oh, I'm just going to copy what that guy does. Mm -hmm. That doesn't work. You have no blueprint. You got to figure out your own style. And uh, as far as catching fish, that's the biggest thing I would recommend anyone listen to is just stay within your own style. Stay, everyone's yeah. stay with your own style, but then don't be afraid to ride trends. You know, mm -hmm. I yeah, mean, some things are important, you know, like this year, the mag draft was a really big thing. That's Yeah, I was going to bring that up. Mag draft while it's hot. That's a good tool. Even if it's a temporary tool, I like to find things like like this, like the underspin, where it's like, that's something I'm going to carry on for a long time. I don't even know if I'll ever stop fishing this on tidal water. You know, it's just something I can rely on. That's a tool in my tool belt. You know, I like to have things I can count on like that. But you need to be able to, you know, keep up with the time, so to speak. Uh, like the glide bait thing. Like, I'd love to put in the time and learn the glide bait thing. But at the same time, I'm not sure that's my style. So it's like you got to pick and choose. It's all who you are. Mm -hmm. 
Um, and I think you see that with all the top tournament guys. I mean, you talk to them and they all win in wildly different ways. Scott, I, I can't thank you enough for, for coming on the show tonight. Um, yeah, I mean, you have a great career ahead of you. I mean, this is just two years. In two years, you went from, you know, trying to please a girl and, and show her a good time on a kayak to winning back-to-back events. And then the first day of a, of a Hobie series, you know, showing the people who you are. Um, what do you have coming up for you? And is there anyone you can, we can help you give a shout out to? Uh, coming up, I got Battle of Five Lakes 2. Again, not a, not a strong suit for me, but we're going to just see what I can learn about the lakes. If I don't get a limit, I'm not that stressed. I'm I'm coming into what I need to make happen. I'm still learning the deep water stuff. Uh, I might be doing Bassmaster Susquehanna in October. Virginia Bassmaster Kayak Trail seems like it's kicking off next year. The info's kind of... But they're doing a Smith Mountain Lake Tournament in October. Plan to be at that one. And then that's that's pretty much the rest of my season. It's looking like. Uh, only thing I have to plug really is uh, Instagram, Scott Skinner, two R's. Uh, you can see my name in the video description or whatever. Facebook, just my name. And uh, that's really it. Scott, I mean, I, I really can't thank you enough for coming on. I mean, you got the Battle of Five Lakes coming up. You also clearly will be in the Angler of the Year tournament um, at the end, where, wherever that will end up being held. Uh, so hopefully we'll have you back on for another win. But dude, hopefully, th- thank you so much again. Again, guys, like and subscribe to the channel. It really helps us out in the algorithm. Give us a follow on Spotify, iHeart, or Apple Podcasts. I mean, we are the number one fishing show in the greater DMV metropolitan area. And we'll see you next time on Fishing the DMV. Bye. You're listening to Fishing. Fishing the DMV with your host, Thomas Ahrens. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle, located in Winchester, Virginia. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will.